the family of First Baptist Church Indian Trail welcomes you. Join with Senior Pastor Dr. Mike Whitson as we present Decision for Life. Welcome to First Baptist Church Indian Trail. So if you have your Bibles, I want you to turn with me today to Proverbs chapter 14. Proverbs chapter 14. Uh, I am grateful to God to be Southern Baptist. I am grateful for what uh, God is doing through the tremendous mission efforts of uh, the Southern Baptist Convention and uh, grateful for uh, how our missionaries are taken care of, the cooperative spirit among churches to ensure that the gospel gets uh, scattered all over the world. Uh, you may have read, though, um, the uh, post results of the convention this year that may have struck a chord maybe in your heart just a little bit and uh, I am going to get out on a limb today and that's okay uh, but we were told at the convention this year that any church uh, that seeks to be political in its approach to ministry um, <clears throat> and uh, where a pastor encourages the church in political things, uh, he then is a stooge. Well, I guess you're going to look at a stooge this morning uh, according to what we have been told. The Bible tells us in verse 34 of chapter 14, righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Um, you don't have to go very far. You don't have to turn your channel on too loud on the television. You don't have to listen very intently to discover a lot of people that are saying a lot of things that are wrong with America. Uh, but I think there are a lot of things right with this country. I am thankful for the ability that God has given to you and me in this land to join together, to assemble, and to worship Almighty God. I am grateful to be able to preach today without fear of reprisal. I am grateful for the ability to pick up a pen and put it paper and be able to write. I am grateful for the free speech that uh, we have uh, today. I am grateful to belong to a country that takes care of me when I travel onto foreign soil and protects me while I am there. I am grateful. Uh, that we live in a land that we are innocent until proven guilty. I am thankful for those that have given their blood and any, even their lives to ensure the freedoms that you and I today currently enjoy. Much is right. Let me say it again. Much is right uh, in this country and we need to pause from time to time and just simply thank God for America. I am grateful for our beginnings. I am grateful for how this country was founded. I am discovering more and more. Uh, I'll be uh, uh, this next year's old this next week. And I am discovering more and more and more the power of prayer. I dare say I've had more prayers answered since January of this year than several years in gone by. I, I don't know if that's an indictment on my prayer life or it's just the outpouring blessings of God on my life. I don't know. But I, I'm discovering that uh, God answers prayer more and more and more. Much is right with this country. I'm discovering that the foundation of our nation was based on the word of God more and more than I ever realized. Based not on the word of man, but on the word of God. Now I'm, I'm going to give you three words today that uh, I pray that you will 
take away. Three words that I hope that you'll take away today. First of all is the word educated. Or you could supplement that word with the word informed. We, we need to be informed about this country. Um, although uh, I am proud to be an American, I am proud of America, uh, we would be extremely naive if we didn't uh, agree that there's still a lot of blemishes, there's still a lot of inconsistencies uh, in this nation. For instance, uh, you don't need to be naive about the fact that we have a government that not only condones but promotes perversion and is seeking even to ensure that our court system, uh, in our court system that a perverted lifestyle is a protected lifestyle. We need to be informed that a government that legally endorses the merciless slaughter of over 3,000 babies a day. Um, it's a shame that our country has gone full, full circle when we're locking up a, a person who kills an alligator or a spotted owl or a manatee, we lock them up for two or three years and charge them an unbelievable amount of money while at the same time endorsing the murder of the innocent. It is tragic and I thank God though, I, we have many educators in my own family. I am grateful for them. I am grateful for the money that we spend on education in this country, but there is something wrong when I am told that as many as 750,000 graduate high school on an annual basis that cannot even read their own diploma. There's something wrong. Part of a nation that has plunged into such a national debt that I am told that it may take as many as 3,000 years just to pay the interest alone on that debt. We need to be informed about the myths that we've been sold, that the myth that has been sold to our kids and the myth that has been sold to our grandkids. Myth number one, you ready for this one? That our nation was not founded by godly or religious people, but by atheists and humanists and deists who said that simply uh, God created everything and set it in motion and then stepped back and let it run its own and on its own. When in fact, ladies and gentlemen, the 55 signers of the Declaration of Independence, 52 of them were born again, blood washed, spirit filled men of God who believed that the nation was founded on the principles and the precepts of the word of God. Would to God that even today, I, I believe that this message probably needs to be preached on an annual basis where we bring the children and the grandchildren, our students and bring them in and let them be reminded of how this country was founded. Found it very interesting and also ironic uh, that at the University of Houston did a study on the Declaration of Independence and discovered that 34% of the contents of the Declaration of Independence came directly out of the Word of God. Over one-third of the Declaration of Independence came from the Bible. Patrick Henry, you all know, made a wonderful declaration himself that we all could repeat, give me liberty or give me death. But I wonder how many of you really realize or have read the context of that statement. Let me give it to you. I quote, we shall not fight alone. God presides over the destiny of nations. The battle is not to the strong alone. Is life so dear or peace so sweet as to be purchased at the price of chains and slavery? Forbid it, almighty God. Give me liberty or give me death. Benjamin Franklin said, he who shall introduce into the public affairs the principles of Christianity will change the face of the world. 
John Jay, and also signer of the Declaration of Independence, made this statement. He said, Providence has given to our people the choice of their rulers, and it is their duty as well as privilege in the interests of our Christian nation to select and prefer Christians as their rulers, unquote. How can we forget that our nation was founded on the three, well, the three branches of our government were founded directly out of Isaiah 33, 22. How can we forget the separation of powers concept came from Jeremiah chapter 17. How can we forget that the concept of the tax exempt status came out of the book of Ezra in the seventh chapter in the 24th verse? Let me just say a word to you. Those 55 men not only knew God, they knew the word of God. And when they put these papers together called the Declaration of Independence, it was saturated with what God had put in their heart through his word. And then there is the myth of the separation of church and state. I think the next person that ever comes to me and throws that into my face, I think I'm just gonna throw up on them. I've heard it about all that I want to hear. Why you say that, preacher? Well, if that's something that folks hold, here's what I just dare. Then show it to me in the Declaration of Independence. Give me the paragraph. Give me the sentence. Show it to me directly if that is true. John Quincy Adams, one of the signers, made this statement. He said, the highest glory of the American Revolution was this. It connected into one indissoluble bond, the principle of civil government and the principles of Christianity together. The First Amendment reads, Congress shall make no law establishing, respecting the establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. What, what a word. What, what a word. It doesn't mean the separation of church and state. In the original context in which it was recorded, ladies and gentlemen, it was put in there to keep one denomination from dictating government to everybody else. Make no mistake about it. Our founding fathers wove the teachings of Paul, the teachings of the Lord Jesus Christ, the word of God inextricably with the laws of this land. No doubt about it. Now, in 1796, there was a Supreme Court ruling in a case, and I looked this up, of Runkle versus Wisemiller. And here was the findings of that Supreme Court. By our, and I quote, by our form of government, the Christian religion is the established religion of all sects and denominations of Christians, for we are all placed in the same and equal footing. We need to be informed. We need to be educated. Now, the second word that I want to give you today is this. It is the word integrated or involved, if you will. Integrated or involved. Um, let, let me make this statement. I, uh, I, I know the liberal tendencies of um, denominations. I do know that. But I also know, according to the word of God, that you and I have a civic responsibility to be involved in the destiny and the direction of this country. We make no apologies in standing on the word of God that a few years ago, about 10 years ago or so, uh, I stood before you and I said, uh, we need a moral task force established at First Baptist. And since then we have established one and it's called the Cultural Impact Team. And they are led by some godly people that meet on a regular basis who are very sensitive and watch what's going on in legislation to make sure that you and I are informed about what is going on in the legal world around us that is going to be impacting and also leading us even into a more secular and ungodly society. 
Thank God for these men and women who give their time. Edwin, Edmund Burke made this statement. He said that the only way for the sure triumph of evil is for good people to do nothing. You say, what do I do? What do you mean involved? What, what, what do you mean integrated? Well, the first thing that you ought to do is that you ought to make sure that you are registered to vote. I, I'm, I'm grateful. Well, go ahead. I, I'm grateful to report to you that First Baptist Church Indian Trail has, if not the highest, one of the highest percentages of members that are registered to vote as any church in America. And I will report to you too on our findings, not only are the membership of this church registered to vote, they actually go and vote. Thank God. Actually follow through. Then you need to find out what each candidate believes. You need to find out what their convictions are. You, you need to find out where they stand, and, and I'm not talking about Democrats, and I'm not talking about Republicans, and I'm not talking about independents. I'm talking about where an individual that is running for a public office is and find out what their convictions are and those that are standing true to the word of God, vote them in and if they get in there and they don't stand up for what they said that they believe in the next election in the name of Jesus, vote them out. That's what we can do. Uh, I, uh, I speak now probably to a younger generation that's here this morning. You say, how did we get to where we are in America, how do we get in the mess that we're in? Well, let me give you several major decisions that were made that led to our current condition. Um, there was a pivotal time in 1962 when the Supreme Court took prayer out of our school system after 200 years of schools every day opening up with the word of God and with prayer. Further, in 1963, we removed the Bible out of the classroom and banned it from all public and state-supported institutions. Here was the explanation. You ever wondered, you know, what motivated them? What was behind the scenes? What, what created such a sentiment? Well, let, let me tell you. Let me, let me give you one of them here. This will really bless you. Here was the explanation. If portions of the New Testament were read, and I'm quoting, if portions of the New Testament were read without explanation, they could be and have been psychologically harmful to children. 1965, the right of every student to bow their head and pray publicly over their meal was taken away. In 1967, the court outlined this very simple nursery rhyme. I want you to listen to it now. It goes like this. We thank you for the flowers so sweet. We thank you for the food we eat. We thank you for the birds that sing. We thank you for everything. And they'll question, why did you make that an unconstitutional decision? Here was their response. Although the word God was not used in the nursery rhyme, if someone were to hear it, it may cause them to think of God and is therefore unconstitutional. And we wonder how we got to where we are. You understand, when the court declares something unconstitutional, it's really inferring that our founding fathers were men who drafted the Constitution would have opposed it. Oh, but listen, James Wilson, one of the signers of the Declaration, made this statement, and he was also uh, one of the original members of the United States Supreme Court and co-author of many of the commentaries on the Constitution. And, and this is what he had to say about it. He said, human law must rest its authority ultimately upon the authority of that which is divine. Far from being rivals or enemies, religion and law are twin sisters, 
Indeed, these two societies run into each other. The divine law forms an essential part of both. Ladies and gentlemen, what we need in this country are some judges that will quit trying to legislate from the bench and simply carry out what the established law already is. 1980, I remember it well. America made the decision to take the Ten Commandments down off the walls of our schools in every government-related building. And I also find it intriguing that third world countries right now are begging to have it put up on their walls. In 1992, one of the most um, recent destructive decisions said that there would be no invocation or prayer ever prayed at a high school commencement or state supported school. Uh, interestingly enough, a Hindu joined the faculty of Tennessee State University. Wasn't there long until he sued the university because of them having prayer at certain functions uh, of the university. And the president complied with the court's ruling and uh, so they stopped having prayer. That year, during their graduation exercise, the president said, well, let's have a moment in, of silence instead of the prayer. And so they were doing that at the graduation. And in that moment of silence, a lady stood up, one of the guests of the graduates stood up, and she started quoting aloud the Lord's Prayer. A second one joined her, a third, a fourth, a dozen, hundreds joined in in the Lord's Prayer at Tennessee State University's graduation. A journalist asked her why she did such a thing as that, why she felt it necessary, why did she feel it to be important. Her response was this, I have a right to pray. In 1960, 92% of all teenagers were virgins. By 1990, and recent statistics uh, bear this out too, by 1990, 75% uh, of all high school graduates had already lost their virginity. We're spending billions and billions of dollars on sex education. As a matter of fact, uh, I looked at the figures yesterday and it's about $5 billion every five years or so to that, or a billion dollars every five years, I think it was, a billion dollars every five years. But without prayer and without the moral guidelines, we're seeing over 2,000 teenagers get pregnant every day, resulting in 400,000 births. 623 STDs contracted daily. That is the result of a nation that has deteriorated in its morality. Let me give you the third word and we'll close with this one, okay? It's the word supplicated. Educated, informed, integrated, involved, supplicated. To be in prayer. If my people, the Bible says, who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, God says, I will forgive you and I will heal your land. How we need to pray. More now than ever before found it so interesting, so intriguing, and so disappointing. Our president, regardless of how you feel about him, that would matter which president, it just happens to be the current president, about three weeks ago, called a church in the area of Washington, D.C., and asked them if he came by, would they pray for him? And they said yes. It was a Sunday morning. 
So he called him, let him know I'm here. Pastor stopped the service and the president came to the platform and the pastor led that season of prayer uh, over the request of uh, the president. You know what? We're commanded, aren't we, to pray for the rulers that God has placed over us? I found it so disappointing the next day after that, this preacher was accosted by his own membership for prayer. May I ask you, when in the world is it ever wrong to pray? When is it ever wrong to pray? God tells us to pray for those that he has placed in leadership over us. Now, I'm not going to align myself with the prophets of doom. I'm just not going to do it. Um, I, I, I believe with all of my heart that revival in America is possible. God promised it, that if we would humble ourselves, that if we would pray, if we would seek him, he said, I will hear you. I will forgive you. I will heal your land. I believe that we're on the verge of seeing a move of God in this country. I really do. Never thought that Roe versus Wade would ever be overturned. But I'm watching state after state after state making some great determinations and pray for North Carolina. This may not be significant to you, but the last three funerals that I've conducted, I've seen almost 300 people come to faith in Christ and walk down an aisle and surrender their life to the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm seeing the glimpse of revival in this country. I believe the word of God. And if he sends revival to this country and we do exactly what he says that we are to do, and to humble and pray and seek his face, God will send revival so that country after country and nation after nation will one more time look at America and they could declare the hand of God is on America. I believe it. I believe it. I wonder would you stand with me and let's spend just a moment in prayer together. I wonder how many of you would slip out of your seat just now and just make your way here to the altar, either stand or kneel, whatever you feel comfortable in doing on behalf of America. How many of you would come and say, God, you said in Chronicles that if we would pray and seek you that you would hear us and that you would respond and that you would heal us. And, and how many of you would come right now and just find a place and intercede on behalf of this great nation? On behalf of this great nation, come and seek God. If you can't get to the altar, just step out into the aisle or pray right where you are. You're in the balcony up there, just pray right up there if you'd like to. Father God, we come before you now as humbly as we know how. Lord, to do exactly what you said that we should do, that's to intercede on behalf of America. God, we're seeing divisions like never before in Washington. Racial tension as high as ever in my lifetime. We're seeing injustices, right being called wrong and wrong being called right. We are watching people doing what they consider to be right in their own eyes, disregarding the word of God altogether. The slaughter of innocent children continues at an unprecedented rate. And 
And so here we are in your presence, abiding by your word, seeking you on behalf of this country. Forgive us for the mistreatment of others. Forgive us for the mistreatment of the unborn. Forgive us for the lack of prayer for our leaders. Forgive us for the lack of involvement in the affairs of our land. Standing up for what your word has spoken. With your help, we will lead to change. With your help, we'll continue to pray. Send revival to America. May Jesus be glorified in everything that we do. We humbly pray this now, expecting great things from above, from your hand. In Jesus' name we pray. For watching Decision for Life, our location, life group, and program information are available online at fbcit.org. We hope you will take the opportunity to join us in person. Thank you from the family of First Baptist Church Indian Trail.